motion. So we're here at last in our final theme, that being set in motion. Of course, alongside everything else, I want to start off with some artist research, which is what I'll be doing now. To start off this episode, I looked into some more artist research, as I always do. I looked into an artist called Umberto Boccioni, who was an Italian artist who did a lot of paintings and sculptures, which emphasis the art movement of dynamism. I looked at many of his sculptures, but the one I was particularly interested in was his unique forms of continuity in space, a bronze sculpture, which can be seen as an expression of motion and fluidity, which I believe would be excellent for the theme of set in motion. Next, I looked into Alberto Giacometti, who I had done a lot of research into in a previous project, so I already had some information there. I particularly enjoyed his rough-looking sculptures and busts, which I felt really exuded the aura of set in motion, which is something that isn't properly set in certain stone, but is constantly moving. I also looked into Jackson Pollock, who was very famous for his abstract expressionism paintings, such as Blue Poles, which is one of my favourite pieces by him, and one of the ones I focus on mainly. Now, unusually from this, I stepped out of the artist research and into a more physics research. As at the time of this episode making, I was researching quantum physics in my physics A-level, and I felt particularly inspired by this topic in general, so I decided to look more into it. I looked into a few specific theories, those being string theory, super string theory, and quantum field theory, all of which represent the idea of set of motion. And the basic idea of string theory is that everything is built up of a small string, as opposed to small particles that vibrate and oscillate at different frequencies so to create different shapes. Quantum field theory is a suggestion that everything is connected on a quantum field and it's just small packets of energy that we observe as mass. I believe that these few ideas really emphasize the set of motion theory as it shows that everything is interconnected and also everything is constantly moving and I really like this idea and I felt like I could take heavy inspiration for it. After talking to some other designers, I started to think, what kind of extra research can I do to really influence the idea of set in motion? And I came across the idea of optical illusions, something that looks like it's moving and yet isn't at all. And I find that idea very interesting. I really like the idea of optical illusions and I definitely want to look into this more. So I've done a bunch of research into various forms of optical illusions that have something to do with motion and I'll be showing that to you right now. All right, so one of my first illusions I looked into doesn't actually have a name, and the best I could find it referred to is the illusion of motion through vertical slits, so that's what I'll be referring it to. The way it effectively works is you have an image with multiple frames, in the best case scenario being six, all of which are spliced together in a single image, and you move a sheet of black lines over it, and as you do, it shows each individual frame at a moment, and it thus tricks the eye into thinking it sees an animation of some sorts. Effectively, our eyes track the moving slits, so we perceive them as not moving. And because the slits are evenly spaced, the motion repeats as the next slit in line moves over the same part of the drawing behind it. Therefore, our brain sees a cyclical animation, even though the drawing isn't moving at all. I quickly made my own animation inspired by quantum physics, which I would use later on with an experiment. Another set of illusions I found are high-speed rotating illusions. Mainly, I started looking into a zoetrope, which is a circular device that when spun you can look through slits and see an animation player in front of you due to the high rotational speed. I looked into a bunch of similar concepts that were evolved from or evolved into the zoetrope, those being the phenakistocope, a 2D wheel that when spun causes an illusion of the entire circle moving, which is limited by forcing the user to have multiple animations in the same cycle which I was not a big fan of, the thaumatrope, a two-sided circle that when spun creates a slight illusion as the two images will merge into one by the brain, such as the classic bird in the age thaumatrope, and finally a praxinoscope, which is a successor to the zoetrope, would utilize an inner circle of mirrors that the user would observe in replacement of the above slits. These mirrors would be placed so that reflections of the pictures appeared more or less stationary in position as the wheel turned, and I believe that this was a more effective method of the zoetrope. I also looked into the stroboscopic effect and the temporal aliasing in which it is effectively an effect that occurs when a continuous motion is represented by a series of short or instantaneous samples. It happens a lot in rotating objects and is often called the wagon wheel effect because as a wheel moves at a certain speed, it matches with our brain's shutter speed and we begin seeing it as a continuous, a still image almost. And sometimes in, as it increases in speed, it begins to look as if it's reversing almost. This kind of effect also happens with train tracks, as you can see above where it appears to change its direction momentarily. 
This is, this is especially emphasized when taking a video of something as the shutter speed of a camera is much lower than the shutter speed of a human eye. My final optical illusion I looked into were color influenced discs where I had two discs in specific, that being the Newton disc of primary colors and the Benham top, which shows the effects of Fechner color. Now the Newton's wheel of primary colors, when it's rotated at high speeds, begin to bleed into just a white color, as you can see here. And I, want, I feel like that effect is really cool. However, the Benham top, creates the opposite effect, where it shows off the Fechner color effects, where as it rotates at high speeds, it begins to create the illusion of color. And apparently, this cannot be videoed, which I find very interesting, and I'd love to see it in person. I'm not entirely sure how I'll represent this, but I'll do my best. After doing some more research into optical illusions, I found that I was very interested in them, just like I had predicted. So what I decided to do next was to look at all my list of optical illusions I found, and then perform them all in a form of experiment which I will be doing following. Now my first experiment was my zoetrope experiment where I made a 16 frame animation of a string moving up and down which I sampled from a skip rope moving up and down so I could get a more realistic vibrational string. And then I created a little strip of paper which would have around 30 centimeters in length and two centimeters in height. My first attempt was to 3D print a model but I really got the zoetrope concept incorrect so instead I laser cut some slits out of, of aeroply and then curved it around a circle and then used two-part glue to connect the strip to around the circle base and placed my my paper strip of the animation frames inside then I placed it on a potter's wheel and spun it at high speeds starting from a low speed as you can see here and slowly building up to a high speed for this experiment I found three interesting results the animation looks best when seen through the naked eye at high speeds as the mind blocks out the strips much better. Number two, the slits begins to look slanted with greater speed, although this may be caused by the angle of the camera, I'm not entirely sure. But if you look, they appear to be still at the first, but then they appear to be slanted, which I find very interesting, and I'm not entirely sure why. And even more interestingly, as the speed increased, if one pays attention to the foreground wood instead of the animation itself, you may see that the stroboscopic effect takes place where it begins to look still for a second, then starts reversing in direction, as you can see here, here, and here. So the Zoetrope was a massive success, with me being able to find out several different effects that I didn't know earlier, and doing a lot of experimentation, and understanding how they work in real life. Obviously I could have improved upon it a lot more, especially with the 3D model, but either way, the point still stands, and I really like this idea of Zoetrope, and I like the idea of animation through fluidity. My next experiment was the optical illusion of motion with vertical slits. Now, basically, I made two different shapes, a joint circle and a vibrating string, as inspired by my quantum physics superstring theory. Now, I made a six-frame animation where it would, it would start, like, splurging out, like, in moments like here, and then it would start to reform into its basic circle shape and then that would create a continuous animation. Now, as you can see, I made the animation on Photoshop and did a quick video of it, so I, would, I could show off what it's supposed to look like. Then I printed out the black line slits onto acetate, and I also printed out just the slits onto paper, making sure to get the dimensions accurate. Next, I took a video of both of them and slid my acetate across it to make it look as if it was animated. And, what, and I believe that the loop string, so the circle, I believe that the loop string, that the circle, came out really well with this one. I think it showed off how I think it showed off the animation principle extremely well. Whereas this single string, I believe, had two thin parts, so it resulted in the string looking almost not there at times, and the animation looked a bit jagged. So I've learned from this that to get this vertical slit solution correct, you want to make the shape as thick as possible. Next was my disc experiments, which I did quite a few of. Next, initially, I made some discs out of ceramics, just some basic ceramic discs which I did because I was experimenting a lot with ceramics this time. And on each side of this disc, I placed a printed out Benham top and a printed out Newton color disc. I then tried to spin it at high speeds. Unfortunately, both of these experiments effectively resulted in a failure of the initial desire. <laughs> but I did find some, because at first the potter's wheel wasn't fast enough to do anything. Then I tried a, then I tried a drill and then I tried an even faster drill which resulted in three different results. And the third result, the fastest one, was obviously the most successful. I didn't get the effect I desired, with the Benham top only exuding a small amount of color, but not enough to make it interesting, even in the video or in real life. It just wasn't that great. However, the Newton disc did come very interesting because what I saw in real life, the colors, they were a lot more murky and brown to what was recorded on the video, which I found very interesting. My final disc experiment was also done in ceramics, however this time I wanted to test the concept on a thermotrope. So I fired a new disc and painted some blue poles as design onto one side with glazes. 
I used a multitude of colors to see how they would merge well together, and I want to see what they look like. I used royal blue, awesome gold, pewter, and storm gray, I believe. To emphasize his style, with each different color, I tried a different technique. I tried to do long brush strokes, which were flicked from a large angle. I wanted to st have splotches dropped from above. I wanted to do... I wanted to close my eyes and lightly place drops here and there so I could get some sort of natural spiritual effect. Of course, I should mention I used wax on both on the underside of all the discs as long, along with the rest of my ceramic experiments so that they'd be fine in the kiln. I then fired this, I then fired my piece and the rest of my ceramics at 1150 degrees Celsius and found a bluish result, which resulted in an interesting, it's, it was, it didn't come out quite how I expected it to, but it did come out in a way that was very interesting that looked almost like rusted copper with bronze and green lighting apart from the royal blue pole. Next I went onto Photoshop and just switched the hue and the saturation around so I get a reverse image and placed it on the other side of the thaumatrope. Following you can see my best attempts to spin it at high enough speeds but unfortunately I came across nothing that could do it correctly uh, and I did not get the result I desired at first. With the only success from this experiment being really a glazed effect of rusted copper which I found quite interesting. I performed all my optical illusion experiments at this point, but I was still trying to find something functional that I could apply as a final work piece. So I started looking to the areas I'd explored already. I'd explored lighting, furniture, clock type utensils. So what was left for me, and something I felt particularly interested in, especially at GCC, was kitchenware. So I decided to look at how I could make kitchenware represent the theme of set in motion, and I came up with a concept of a series of products which I'd dubbed kinetic kitchenware. The thing about kinetic kitchenware is that it's a very simple concept where I'm designing several forms of kitchenware either through the process for the process of eating or for the process of cooking, which is intends to do one of two things. Number one, either free up space, or number two, increase interactivity and change into the kitchen. By this I mean some form of movement or change in shape, and I believe that this shift in environment will help keep a meal more fresh, keep it more interactive and I'm aiming to improve socializing and creativity through this process. So I came up with a, a, a variety of ideas here with one being my super strength kinetic kitchenware ideas where I came up with a lot and a lot of ideas that related to vibrating strings. My personal favorites being the kinetic kitchenware fork where I'd have a fork type shape which would have a vibrating string in it that could react to heat or sound or something or the other to change its vibrational frequency. Now while nothing came out of these string experiments per, per se, I did like the idea of the kinetic kitchenware fork shifting to change to its environment and I put that into practice much later. Another bunch of ideas I had were platter related. My first one was just a simple rotating platter based off a Lazy Susan where you'd have different layers that could rotate but that was too simple for me so I moved on to a magnetic platter which, would, which you could have little plates which you could take off. You could get what pieces of the food you on the platter you want, put it onto your section and take off your magnetic platter and you can put it back later. I found this idea interesting, but I decided to look into a different idea, that being the vertical rotating platter, which would act kind of like a Ferris wheel and have a lot of things on it. Small platters for cheese, crackers, biscuits, grapes, all sorts of small foods and a big jug shape in the center, which, would, which could store a lot of water or juice or anything like that. So you could have a little thing that you can rotate, thus increasing the interactivity, and also have store a lot of the food you need on it, thus freeing up space. At the same time, I began doing some research into a Japanese aesthetic called Wabi Sabi. It's a worldview centered around the acceptance of transience and imperfection, where typical characteristics of this aesthetic were asymmetry, simplicity, roughness, austerity, and appreciation of both natural objects and the forces of nature. It was centered around the Buddhist teaching of the three marks of existence. I should apologize for not being able to pronounce these correctly, I'm certain. Number one, Anika, stating that all conditioned things are in a constant state of flux, i.e. all physical and mental events come to being and then dissolve, with a good representation being that of a human life, which embodies this flux with the aging cycle and reincarnation cycle, samsara. Number two, Dukkha, meaning suffering, unsatisfaction, oriness, or pain. This encompasses the physical and mental suffering that follows each birth, rebirth, and aging and the dissatisfaction with getting what one wished to avoid or failing to achieve a desired result. And number three, anatta, in reference to the doctrine of non-self. This implies that there is no perfect permanent soul and there is no abiding presence in anything or phenomena. There is only the constant present, in, which is shifting entirely. Your personality, your soul, your spirit, you are constantly shifting. 
So with this concept of Wabi Sabi explored, I particularly interested the aesthetic with the rustic vibe to it, and also more importantly, the theme of it. While I don't understand the nuances of it at all, clearly, I still can take inspiration from it as I've done with quantum physics. And both of them relate very well together because I'm looking heavily into this theme of set in motion and the idea that everything is set in a state of flux, constantly changing, constantly shifting, much like a human soul, which is something I want to impart upon these next products. My first idea was an auto-balancing jug, which was just a simple kinetic kitchenware idea that as it falls, I'd have some sort of mechanism to close off the jug, so therefore nothing would spill out, maybe as a soy sauce thing. I didn't really like this idea as it wouldn't hold up in comparison to a multitude, multitude of other products that already existed. Nonetheless, I decided to make a Fusion 360 model. And you can see it right here. Now here's where ideas get interesting. Thermo-shifting cutlery. I had a few interesting ideas with this, for example the heated knife, which would heat up as it cuts bread, therefore creating a lightly, a lightly warm bread, which is much nicer than the cold bread you have most mornings, and some color changing forks, which would result in the color shifting and result into heat. And I really like this idea as it relates back to my vibrational fork from earlier and how it relates, relates to environmental factors to create a shift in its appearance. And I also had a separate idea, which would include a, like a pen into the back of a fork so we could have like a whiteboard down so people could share ideas while eating. I felt that this would emphasize creativity so I combined these two ideas into one and formed two different forms of a ceramic fork or pointer. I bought some color changing black paint, did an experiment on a mug and then painted the ceramic fork type shape in the color changing black paint which works by applying a matte black followed by a rainbow changing liquid which would shift in color at 28 degrees. To test this out with a mug I used hot water and it came up with extremely successful results whereas with a fork I actually lost the pen that was designed to be in it so I couldn't have the pen side but the color changing aspect could still be seen even if only a slightly and I really enjoy this color changing aspect and I don't know if it's food safe which is the slight issue with it but I would love to see if I can use it in some other aspect as seen with various color changing mugs that already exist my next idea was focused around storage, and one of these ideas was in particular in relation to storage during the creating process of the meals. Cutting your food, dicing your food, cooking your food, all that stuff. The idea was to have two separate cutting boards that would fold out, and several containers inside where you could store food. For example, diced onions, sauces, cheese, all that stuff that you can like then add on to the meal later. After rendering the model, I decided to make a physical model and a scale model like that, as you can see by the shape of my hands. Compared to it, obviously it would be much larger with the boards that fold out, taking up more of a, well, cutting board shape. Then I wanted to experiment with two different ideas, hinges and almost like a foldable paper type. So, so I got some wood, bandsawed a bunch of pieces together, drilled some holes and used two part glue to add brown paper and hinges to one side to create a little box that could fold out and have two sides to cut on and also space to store your stuff. I had finally come to the end of my kinetic kitchenware ideas, at least those which were developed enough to be shown. You can see others on my website page down below. I've got more ideas for kitchenware which aren't specifically related to the kinetic kitchenware series, but are much more related to the extra research I've been doing throughout this place. Not to say optical illusions, more stuff like the Jao Kometi, quantum physics, Wabi Sabi research, all that stuff I wanted to put into two more products I'm going to make now, which show off the idea of kitchenware that doesn't is it's per se kinetic but still proves off the theme of set in motion. My first idea I dubbed the Boccioni candle holder which was inspired by Boccioni's unique forms of continuity in space where I wanted to create a shape that would be constantly moving and in flux. So what I did was I had some ceramic spare left over. I created some shape, sh quick petal like shapes as seen in his bronze sculpture. I then got a metal pipe and polished it and then spray painted everything with a bronze color as unfortunately we did not have any metal gray colors. I saw the pipe off to give it a correct space and I spray gave it another coat of spray paint and left it over the night. I glued everything together and it was only then that I noticed that somehow an orange dot had got on top of my candle holder. So what I did was I took some pictures with the orange dot and went on Photoshop and used the clone tool to remove it in post. And I think this came off very well. You can barely see the orange dot anymore. And I really like this idea of the candle holder. And I think with some extra dimensions changing and some more forp into the shape and movement of it, I could create a much more appealing candle holder than your standard candle holder. My final idea was an idea I labeled Duke, which was its name. But effectively, I created a symmetrical appealing mug on the potter's wheel which i want to experiment with using ceramics and then i ruined it 
Taking inspiration from Giacometti, Wabi Sabi, and the constant state of flux that had inspired a majority of this theme, I added small portions of wrinkles, I pressed in with my nails, I tried to misshape the shape as much as I want, even going, even blinding myself at some point to create that shape. Then taking insp inspiration from a specific bust by Giacometti, I added eyes, nose, moustache slash mouth type shape, and some ears. Then I added a coat of autumn and a pewter highlight around its eyes. Now the one issue with the mug I had was that the autumn colour was a lot darker than I expected, and, and perhaps it would have emphasised the themes of Wabi Sabi more if I used only a singular colour and avoided the pewter highlight. But either way, I was pleased with how it came out, and I had ended up with three different final products effectively for this theme, as well as a bunch of optical illusion research that I had done previously. And just like that, we finished our final and third theme of our research for C3 set. We've looked into set in time, we've looked into setting environments, and last but not least, we've looked into set in motion. All three of which I have particularly enjoyed and I've done a large amount of research that I think will definitely be useful. However, I can only go through with one theme. All the materials, experiments, and general research I've done will be hopefully encompassed into the final product, at least as much as I can do. However, I must go through with only one theme as my main driving goal. Now the way I've decided to go about this is to make a list of everything I've done in each of the topics, and from that I can then create a list of positives and negatives for each theme, weigh them up against each other, talk some primary users, which I'm going to interview and reveal next episode, and then come to decide a final theme which I'm going to be exploring in my project. Either way, with that being said, that's set in motion finished and I can't wait to see the next episode where we're going to finally decide our final theme and go through the product. Let's go.